Hello saints and future saints, peace, grace, and love, and Christ Jesus be with all of you. In today's study, I'd like to share with you the foundation of all the false teaching that's taking place today in church, uh, you know, the body of Christ, all these different religions that we see out there, all these different uh different studies that we see all over the internet all the false teaching all the different news you know maybe perhaps you've been confused because of all these things and for some reason you just can't put your finger on it and I think this study will shed some light on those some of those things that maybe you weren't made aware of just yet and this brings me to the reason why I've made this video first and foremost the main reason for all my videos is to plant seeds of salvation. Planting seeds of, of salvation among the fields of the lost and also to edify you, to give you information that you can pass on to the other saints to do the same thing for them. And the second reason I'm making this video is for us to study God's word together so we can both grow together in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now today I'm going to be talking about myths. M-Y-T-H-S, the myths that about the body of Christ, the myths about who we are and where we came from, the myths that are still very much alive today. And like I said, myths that make up all the, most of the foundations out there of all the false teachings that we see. Now, I want you to imagine something with me, if you will. Think of the Christian myth as one big puzzle with many smaller pieces to the puzzle so what we're gonna do together is expose the the myth and then we're gonna break it down into smaller pieces so we can see it and by the end of the video you're gonna have a clear picture as to what's taking place all over the world with these false teachings now let me define the myth for you the overall picture the complete puzzle if you will the myth is that Christianity began with the appearance of John the Baptist who heralded the coming of Jesus Christ the Savior and after John's announcement Jesus performed miracles and chose 12 disciples who preached the gospel to everyone baptizing them adding converts to the church and Jesus designated Peter as head of the disciples and head of the church the Jewish leadership rejected Jesus's claims and conspired with the Romans to crucify him and after his crucifixion, Jesus rose from the dead and commanded his disciples to spread the gospel throughout the world. And also following Jesus' ascension, the disciples preached the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And that one of the chief opponents to the disciples was a rabbi named Saul. And in a dramatic confrontation, God saved Saul, who became Paul. And Paul joined Peter and the other apostles, the twelve, and preached the same gospel as they did. They baptized and performed miracles. Okay, now what I've just read to you is the overall picture of this Christian myth. Now, although some parts may be true, the message in itself is false and has caused confusion and contention and false religions to, to sprout all throughout the world. Like all the other studies we do, we need to make our foundation based on right division, understanding how God's Word is written, and we need to compare what people say to what God actually does say in His Word, and like we know, right division is the key. And in order to rightly divide, we need to ask the questions of who, what, where, when, why, and how. So now that we've We've got this big picture of this myth. Let's break it down a little bit by bit and expose the wolves amongst the sheep, shall we? Now, the first part we need to look at is the statement that Christianity began with the appearance of John the Baptist who heralded the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, for those of us who rightly divide and understand dispensations of God, we know that the body of Christ was a mystery. It was a secret that was revealed only to the Apostle Paul. So if Paul was the first person to receive the secret from Jesus, then how did this secret exist before Paul hearing about it, right? It couldn't have existed before Paul. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a secret. It wouldn't have been a mystery. So we have a problem. This mystery, this secret that Jesus reveals to Paul alone was that God was going to build a body of believers, making this body of believers fellow heirs with his son Jesus. Sons and daughters, adopted sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. So at this point, we know that if the secret told to Paul was all about the body of Christ, or Christians as we like to call it today, then Christianity had to start with Paul. Specifically, it had to begin after Paul received the revelations from Jesus about building the body of believers that would one day be called Christians. Now another point, look here at Acts 11:26, And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Did you hear that? And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And John the Baptist was baptizing on the eastern bank of the Jordan River near Jericho. Very, very far from Antioch, my friends. In fact, the name of the people who were followers who believed that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah weren't called Christians. They were known as the followers of the way. Or this way look at Acts 9 2 and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem again in Acts 22 4 and I persecuted this way unto the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women and John the Baptist uh, as much as you would think wasn't a Christian either he was a Jewish prophet we see this in Luke 7 28 for I say unto you among those that are born of women there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he now John was all about the Mosaic law under the dispensation of law he believed that Jesus was the Messiah and would of fulfill the role of Elijah if the Jews would have accepted him and his message but we know what happened the Jews as a nation rejected everything therefore John didn't proclaim Christianity his message was all about the dispensation of law and the coming earthly kingdom John's message was one of repentance and belief in who Jesus was not that Jesus died was buried and rose again for their sins in Matthew 3 1 to 3 in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make his path straight now John knew full well that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah and that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and not with water. In Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy, the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now note here, this verse says, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The first part here indicates, uh, the fire part here, okay indicates judgment this takes place on the Lord's Day Daniel 70th week baptized by fire isn't something you want to be a part of folks it's not a good thing it's not for believers it's going to be for an unrepentant nation of Israel when Jesus takes judgment upon them in Matthew three twelve, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire gather his wheat the second coming when he Jesus will send forth his angels to gather the elect from the four winds and also when he sends the angels forth to gather all the unbelievers and he destroys every one of them 
Now, we also see in another side of John that he, he was a great man, but he too had his doubts over who Jesus was, if he was the real Messiah. And we see in Matthew 11, verse 2 and 3, Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, can you picture this? I can imagine our Lord's reaction when he heard this, his mouth hitting the ground, shaking his head, thinking, what did you just say to me? After everything John had seen already, yet he still doubted that Jesus was the Messiah, and he was questioning if he was truly the Messiah that was prophesied. But our Lord is merciful, and he answers John's question here in Matthew 11, 4-6. Jesus answered and said unto him, them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now Jesus here quotes one of the old prophecies that the Messiah would give sight to the blind, would make the lame walk, would clean, would cleanse the lepers, and would give the deaf their their hearing again. Okay, they would he would raise people from the dead, and he would preach the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. And John was well aware of these prophecies, and that's why Jesus answers him using these things, all part of the Old Testament prophecies that John had seen and read all about his entire life in the synagogues. Now later on, we see John declaring that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He would take away the sins of the world. What John was actually thinking when he said this remains unclear because he couldn't have known about Jesus being killed and then raising from the dead. Not even the twelve knew about this. Okay, They, they were all still spiritually blinded to this fact. In Luke 18, 31-34, Then he took upon him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spit it on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. It wasn't until after the resurrection that Peter and John understood that Jesus would rise from the dead. We see that in John 20, 8 and 9. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now even further, they didn't preach Jesus' death and resurrection even after it occurred. They, could, they, they continued to preach the gospel of the kingdom, repentance and belief. In Acts 2, 37-38, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't see anything about our gospel here at all. There's no 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, obviously, because Paul hadn't received the new gospel, the gospel of grace, our gospel for today. So, are you beginning to see the differences yet? There's two different gospels. Now, the difference is, is that Peter and the others preached the gospel of the kingdom. And Paul, Paul's gospel is a completely different gospel. It's another gospel, the gospel of grace. Two different gospels, folks. Now, because we're talking about two different dispensations, one is the kingdom under the law. The other is our gospel, the salvation by faith alone. There's no kingdom. There's no law. There's just grace in our gospel. After John's preaching... Jesus performs miracles, then he chooses 12 disciples, and they preach the gospel of the kingdom to everyone, baptizing them and adding converts to the church. Now, be careful here. 
When I say adding converts to the church, the word church here means a called out assembly, a group of special people. It's not talking about the body of Christ here, okay? As in the church body today. The word church comes from the word ecclesia or ecclesia, which, which means an assembly. More specifically, to be called out or, or placed into a small assembly of people with the same goals, with the same motivations. So when they were adding converts to the church, it can confuse a lot of people, okay? Because they think the church there, the word church means the church today, and it's not, okay? That just it means they were adding people to the group of believers under the gospel kingdom program. Okay, those who had to repent, be baptized in order to be ushered into the earthly kingdom when their Messiah Jesus returned. So Jesus chooses 12 disciples in Matthew 4, 18 to 22. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. In Matthew 10, 1-4, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first is Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, Jesus chose 12 disciples in Matthew, we see this in 4, uh, 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, who preached the gospel, and their gospel was the kingdom, uh, the gospel of the kingdom. And we see that in Matthew 4, Matthew 9, Matthew 24, Mark 1. Their gospel was in, a, it was in direct contrast to the Apostle Paul, who preached the gospel of grace, the gospel of the grace of God. Now the twelve knew nothing about Paul's gospel. The gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Okay, this hadn't been revealed at this point. So part of this grand myth is that Jesus and the twelve preached to everyone, including both Jews and Gentiles. But again, this is a myth. Look here at Matthew 10, 5-6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. In fact, Jesus himself preached to no Gentiles, except for two, for on a two occasions, once for the Canaanite women, uh, woman and once for the Roman centurion. In Matthew 15, 21 and 28, then Jesus went, thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon and behold a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying have mercy on me O Lord thou son of David my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil but he said answered her not a word and his disciples came and besought him saying send her away for she crieth after us but he answered and said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him. That's interesting. She worshipped him. There's a sign that Jesus was God in the flesh. He accepted her worship, okay, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth. Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And here again we see 
the other example, the centurion in Matthew 8, 5 to 10. And when Jesus was entered into Ca uh, Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and my servant do this, and he, do, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, not, no, not in Israel. So the Apostle Paul tells us what Jesus' mission was in Romans 15, 8 and 9. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the Jews, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The promises were the, prophet, the prophecies given to the prophets that we see in the Old Testament. In verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for, the, for his mercy, and it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. In fact, nowhere in the Bible will you find anything about the twelve disciples preaching to and for the Gentiles, not even after Jesus' resurrection. Their entire program was all about the circumcision, the Jews, for the nation of Israel. Even after the resurrection, the twelve were preaching all about the gospel of the kingdom under the dispensation of the law. Nothing about Gentiles, nothing about salvation by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. All they preached was the kingdom gospel. Okay? Now, here's another myth. The myth goes something like, like this. Jesus designated Peter as head of the disciples and the church. The Jewish leadership rejected Jesus' claims and conspired with the Romans to crucify him. After his crucifixion, Jesus rose from the dead and commanded his disciples to spread the gospel throughout the world. Following Jesus' ascension, the disciples preached the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection to the Jews and Gentiles. So part of this myth is true, but mostly not true. Jesus did make Peter head of the disciples and church. Okay? following Peter's declaration where he identifies Jesus as their Messiah. And we see it in Matthew 16, 16 and 17. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now remember earlier when I, when I told you about the word ecclesia or ecclesia or assembly, also known as church. We need to be careful here too because Peter wasn't assigned as the head of the body of Christ. He was assigned the head of the called out assembly of believers under the kingdom program. Now on a side note here, after knowing this truth about Peter and his mission and who he ministered to under the kingdom program and so on, how is it that the Catholic Church today says that Peter is their leader? They claim that Peter is the first pope. They completely ignore the Apostle Paul's message. So the Catholic Church is following a gospel that belongs solely to the nation of Israel. Catholics are still following the law program under the kingdom dispensation. And that's where all their works, their good deeds based religion comes from. Now, I often get asked, do you think some Catholics are saved right now? And, uh, you know, how can they be saved? When they're, when they're ignorant of the gospel of salvation, only God truly knows if someone is saved or not. But if I had to guess based on what I know now, I'd have to say it's highly unlikely that there's anyone in the Catholic religion that's also in the body of Christ. And that's not only, that doesn't only go to the Catholics, but there's a lot of other people under various religions who call themselves Christians, but are still following the wrong gospel. So I have to ask, you know, how can they be in the body of Christ if they're following a religion based on the kingdom program? Our church body, the body of Christ, begins with Paul, not Peter. And Paul isn't even around yet. So only Paul had knowledge of the body of Christ because Jesus revealed 
this mystery, this secret first to Paul and him alone. Now, remember, Paul didn't receive any of his learnings from people. He got everything he knew straight from our Lord Jesus. Look here at Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter had no idea of equality of Jew and Gentile and never mentioned the body of Christ. Peter addressed Jews only in Acts chapter 2 and 3 and, and preached what he had learned during his three years with the Lord in his earthly ministry. Peter's ministry was consistent with what he had learned from the Lord about not going to the Gentiles and that the Jews came first and they had first priority. In Acts 1 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now after his resurrection Jesus commanded his disciples to spread the gospel of the kingdom to all nations in Mark 16 15 and 8 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover it was this same gospel the gospel of the kingdom that John the baptizer uh, Jesus and the twelve had preached during Jesus's early earthly ministry and Peter's gospel was different from Paul's gospel of grace Paul preached Christ crucified that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead we see that in 1st Corinthians 15 1 through 4 you see Paul's gospel is the good news of salvation by grace but Peter's gospel wasn't about the good news of the cross in fact Peter saw the cross as something shameful that the Jews had done and they they desperately needed to repent for what they had done to their Messiah and we see that in Acts 2:23 him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain in Acts 2:36 to 38 therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the Apostles men and brethren what shall we do they were sorry for what they did then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts 3 13 to 20 the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and Jacob of Jacob the God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life who God had raised from the, who God had raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know yea the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all and now brethren I want that through ignorance ye did this ye did it as did also your rulers but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he hath so fulfilled repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you two very different Gospels also we learn from Scripture that the twelve had no idea about the grace that Paul taught concerning those that think Christianity started at Pentecost here 
the 12 disciples continued to operate under the Mosaic law long after Pentecost. Now Peter, after receiving the vision to go to the house of Cornelius, this was eight to ten years after Pentecost, was still operating under the law, under the kingdom program. And we see just before Peter goes to Cornelius how he feels about it in Acts 10.28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And again, we see Peter's stance on this at the Jerusalem Council in 51 AD. The twelve were still following the law or the dispensation of law, even going so far as to say that unless Gentiles also followed the law, they couldn't be saved. Look at Acts 15.1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. In Acts 15.5-6. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. See, they're talking about Gentiles here. They're saying that it was required for the Gentiles to be circumcised and to keep the law in order for them to be saved. They, they were confused over this. Verse 6, And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. They were discussing the situation and they, they were still following the law, even in 51 AD. And we see Peter here, he takes Paul's side here in Acts 15, 7, 11. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Now the point I want you to see here is this. How much time had passed between the conversion of Paul and when Peter and the rest were still preaching the law or the dispensation of the law uh, needed for salvation even to the Jews. How much time had passed from that point to the Pente from Pentecost to when Peter went to Cornelius and uh, when Paul's conversion took place? Paul's conversion took place somewhere around 34 AD. All right, and we see here Peter and the other Jews arguing over what the Gentiles had to do for salvation. This was 17 years later. Okay, during all this time. Paul had been ministering to the Gentiles and never taught that they were subject to any laws, any Jewish laws under the Mosaic Covenant. In fact, it was quite the opposite. In Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. However, even after this argument at the Jerusalem Council, James and the others in that assembly, they continue to preach that the Mosaic law was still needed for the Gentiles to be saved. They were hard-headed over this. In Acts 21, 18 to 20, in the day following Paul went in with us unto James, and also the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry, Paul's ministry, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Okay? Now, that's another myth. Here's another myth. One of the chief opponents to the disciples was a rabbi named Saul. In a dramatic conversation, 
God saved Saul, who, be who becomes Paul, and Paul joined Peter and the other apostles, the twelve, and preached the same gospel as they did, baptizing and performing miracles and so on. So the first part here is true. Saul was a rabbi. And he, he led the Sanhedrins, uh, the persecution against everyone, especially the Jews who were following the way, okay, followers of Jesus Christ. Now remember, the way was the teaching of repent and be baptized and follow Jesus. Follow Jesus straight into the coming kingdom, their promised covenant that the nation of Israel would inherit the earthly kingdom, also called the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now, Paul makes a deal with the Sanhedrin leadership that if they would support him financially and they would back him, then Paul would go to Damascus. He would track down all the Jews who were following Jesus and he would arrest them. And, you know, many of them died in the process. And we know the story as Paul traveling, he, as he travels to Damascus, our Lord Jesus confronts him in a very personal and powerful way. And Paul's changed forever after this confrontation even changing his name from Saul to Paul okay becoming the apostle to the Gentiles we read about Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 in verse uh, 1 through 22 Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26 now you'd assume that once Paul was converted he'd go straight to the other 12 and begin his ministry alongside Peter and the rest of them but that's not what happens our Lord Jesus gives Paul a unique position, okay, a unique job. Our Lord Jesus literally sets Paul aside by himself, and Paul is removed from everything going on, and the Lord reveals to Paul a new program. Paul's job was to teach a new gospel, specifically to and for the Gentiles. This new gospel, being the gospel of grace, was very different from what Peter and the rest were teaching. They were teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, instead of Paul going to Peter and the others right away, Paul goes to Arabia for a couple years, two to three years, then he heads back to Damascus. And after those years had passed, Paul heads back to uh, Jerusalem to visit with Peter and James for, it says, 15 days. Look at Galatians 1, 16 and 19. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with the flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James and the Lord's brother. James the Lord's brother. So when Paul traveled to, back to Jerusalem, he saw Peter and the Lord's brother James and not the other apostles now it's important to notice what, what took place while Paul visited with Peter and James in Jerusalem Jesus keeps Paul separate from them okay he tells Paul to leave Jerusalem because they wouldn't listen to what Paul was revealing to them the new gospel they were still blind to the new dispensation at this point in Acts 22 17 to 21 and it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem even while I prayed in the temple I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me and I said Lord they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. In the early part of Paul's ministry, as Jesus keeps feeding Paul the new revelation of the gospel of grace, the more Paul learns about the dispensation of grace, we see something interesting. Now, very early in Paul's ministry, he was baptizing just like the, the rest of the twelve were, but as Paul starts understanding what Jesus is revealing to him, he slows down on baptizing more and more. And eventually he stops baptizing altogether. And, and eventually he assigns very little meaning to water baptism. Paul's focus wasn't on water baptism. Instead, Paul's focus was all about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the new gospel program. And we see this gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
But by the time Paul wrote Ephesians, about oh five, six years after he wrote Corinthians, he declared that there would only be one baptism. Ephesians 4, verse 4 and 5, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The phrase, one baptism here, Paul is referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The very moment you're saved, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is a supernatural, spiritual thing that happens. You're sealed in Christ Jesus forever. With the Holy Spirit of promise, this has nothing to do with water at all. In the early part of Paul's ministry, Paul is given the power to perform miracles. And these miracles, actually, they did two things. First, they, they authenticated Paul's ministry. Second, they were as signs to and for the Jews. And we know the Jews require signs to believe, and they always will. Okay, until finally Jesus comes back and they admit that Jesus is the Messiah. We see this in 1 Corinthians one twenty-two: For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But notice here that Paul moves fur as he as he moves further into his ministry he keeps losing the ability to perform miracles the more paul pulls away from the jews and the more he goes towards the gentiles exclusively the less and less he's able to perform the miracles that he had earlier with the jews okay all those miracles were specific to and for the jews as signs to them we see Paul losing all ability to perform these miracles here in Philippians chapter 2 verse 25 to 27 yet I supposed it necessary to send you Aphrodite my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick for indeed he was sick nigh unto death okay Paul couldn't heal him he almost died because he was sick so right there you see there's something different going on with Paul he's now he's not he's not able to perform miracles any, any longer so continuing on in 27 but God had mercy on him and not on on him only but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow okay first Timothy 523 drink here he's talking to Timothy drink no longer water but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities Timothy was often sick he had a stomach problem okay and back then uh, it was very unsanitary the water was polluted with cholera and and all kinds of you know salmonella and all these different bacteria and viruses and stuff uh, it wasn't like today they didn't have chlorine and fluoride and all these chemicals but you know back then they were often a lot more sick than we are today too so Paul tells Timothy to take a little bit of wine uh, back then wine the alcohol in the wine was used as a sanitizer for water it sterilized the water okay it killed a lot of the bacteria and the germs inside the water uh, so they would put a little bit of wine they would mix wine and water together so they would uh, drink it that way so Paul here is telling him drink no longer water alone but use a little wine put a little bit of wine in it for your stomach's sake and thine often infirmities often infirmities here indicates that Timothy was often sick and Paul so but the point behind this is that Paul was not able to heal Timothy okay so we see Paul's lack of miraculous power here in 2nd Timothy 4:20, Aristus abode at Corinth but Trophimus have I left at Maltim sick again we see Paul it wasn't able to heal in fact Paul told the Corinthians that all these miracles were temporary and they wouldn't last forever. In, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Uh, one note on the tongues tongues was a sign. And who are the signs for, friends? The signs were for the Jews. 
for the unbelieving Jews, okay, specifically, and they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Look at verse 10 here again. Which is perfect to come shall be done away. What does Paul mean here with the word perfect? Come. What, what does he mean by that? Well, what he means is it's the completion of the gospel of grace. Okay? When Paul had revealed, as soon as all revelation was given to Paul, and he'd written everything the Lord told him to write for the body of Christ, then it was finished. The perfect had come. So the perfect here being the completed gospel of revelation to Paul from Jesus alone. And all the miracles would cease. No longer would there be a need for anything but God's completed word. Okay, His perfect revelation given through the Apostle Paul for and to us today. The body of Christ Jesus today. So you might be wondering, why did Paul or why did God need Paul at all? Why did God have to add Paul to the rest of them? Well, the answer is simple. God created a different apostle for a different ministry who taught a different gospel to a different group of people, the Gentiles. Paul is the first apostle of the dispensation of grace. Okay, The dispensation that came once the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah and put an end uh, to the dispensation of the kingdom under the law. Now, keep in mind that after Jesus was crucified, uh, he gave them a year. A year extension. He had mercy on them. And he gave them a year to still, uh, they still had a chance to accept him as their Messiah and to usher into the, the kingdom. But at the end of that year is when Stephen spoke up as the prophet. And when Stephen spoke up as the prophet, it was the end of that year. It was the deadline. Okay, God was saying, look, it's time. Uh, and here, here we are. We're at the end of the year. My, my grace is done for, the, for you guys. And make your decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send Stephen. And with Stephen's uh, call to, calling out, crying out to them, it's going to be final. If you reject what Stephen says, then it's over. The dispensation of the kingdom comes to a pause. And God will start a new dispensation through Paul, which lasts 2,000 years. And here we are today. So everyone but Paul, okay, everyone but Paul were teaching the gospel of the kingdom under the law, the Mosaic law. Okay, only Paul was given this new gospel and he was given this gospel by revelation by Jesus Christ himself. And Paul explains uh, Israel's fall and why the gospel had changed in Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Okay, right there, he's giving you a picture of what happened when they killed Stephen. God pressed pause in the program, and there is a 2,000 year period for the fullness of the Gentiles, and during that time, Israel is blinded partially, okay? And uh, when, when the rapture happens, then God is going to press play again. And he's going to continue off where Stephen left off, the dispensation of the kingdom. But and during that time, Daniel's 70th week is going to take place. The tribulation period is going to take place. And at this, the end of those seven years, uh, we're still in the kingdom program. The end of the seven years, when Jesus comes back at the second coming, uh, he's not going to come back until the nation of Israel repents as a nation. Okay, They need to do this as a nation, not individually, but as a nation. They need to repent and admit and call out to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as their Messiah. And at that point, he'll come back and establish the earthly kingdom for them. In Romans 15:16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, here's Paul speaking, ministering the gospel of God, 
that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, wrapping everything up, there's been so much confusion created because of the myths out there that we've just gone over. But the truth is, John the Baptist, a prophet of Israel under the law of Moses, heralded the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And after John's announcement, Jesus performed miracles and he chooses 12 disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews only, okay, with a couple of exceptions. He was baptizing and he was adding converts to the Jewish church, all right? The Jewish church, the, the called out assembly, not the body of Christ. Jesus designated Peter as head of the disciples and of the Jewish assembly, okay? And the Jewish leadership rejected Jesus' claims and conspired with the Romans to crucify him. After his crucifixion, Jesus, uh, Jesus rose from the dead and commanded his disciples to spread the gospel of the kingdom of the kingdom throughout the world beginning at Jerusalem. After Jesus' ascension, the disciples continued to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews only and to keep the Mosaic law. Now, one of the chief opponents of the disciple was, uh, disciples was a rabbi named Saul. And we know in a dramatic confrontation with God, God saves Saul, who becomes Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Paul didn't join Peter and the other ones, the other twelve. He didn't preach the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the gospel of grace of God, that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Our sins being taken into the grave with Christ... And when Christ Jesus rose from the grave in full righteousness, he now covers us with that righteousness. So when our Father in heaven looks at us, he sees us not as in our old nature or our old sins, but in our new nature, covered in the righteousness of his son Jesus. Amen? So he, Paul, declared believers were not under the Mosaic law, but under grace. Paul baptized and he performed miracles, but these activities were solely to the Jews and they ceased as the word of God neared completion and the perfect was made complete. All revelation of the gospel of grace being made final through the apostle Paul. And Paul proclaimed a new gospel, the gospel of grace of God, the preaching of the cross. So the question is, how... Can anybody explain to me why the majority of the churches today are still preaching, repent and be baptized and follow Christ? Can you see now how that gospel has nothing to do with us today in the body of Christ? The gospel of the kingdom will return, but only after the rapture. Once we're removed, the gospel of grace, salvation by faith alone, will come to an end. It will stop. And God will then go back to the gospel of the kingdom to complete the prophecies for the nation of Israel. And they will then they will believe that Jesus is their Messiah. And when they call out to Jesus, then we see the second coming and the rest of the prophecy uh, completely being fulfilled under the dispensation of the kingdom. So the gospel of today is not repent and be baptized and follow Jesus. Our gospel today is 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4, and let me read that. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is Paul speaking. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, but uh, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures that's our gospel for today folks right there Paul saying I declare unto you the gospel by which you are saved that Christ died was buried and rose again the third day that's our gospel for today so with that peace grace and love in Christ Jesus be with all of you and I'll see you on our next study Lord willing